Hi Church, I hope you're all doing well. Recently, Andrew and I have been trying our hand at composting our scraps. I made a little DIY compost bin, found six worms in our garden and got Pastor Benny to donate a container full. That was a few weeks ago. So naturally we gave the worms some, you know, some scraps and some mulch and kind of waited for them to do their thing. And we've been waiting and waiting. Every now and then I'll take the lid off and see if they've made any progress. As of yet, I'm not really sure. Partly because I might not have understood the whole composting process. But also because I can't really see what's happening because it's so dark. And so there's a little part of me that's worried that the worms have sure shank redemptioned and buried through the dirt to the holes of the container that's their prison, thus escaping. That or they're just really, really slow eaters. I'm not sure. If you have any answers or advice, please contact me. But the point I want to make is this. I have no idea if the whole compost thing is working or feel any sense of encouragement whatsoever because I can't see what's happening. Matthew 5, 14 to 16 describes the function of light and the importance of letting others see. Something I wish my worms would grasp. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This passage doesn't seem to need too much explanation. Light is powerful. It shouldn't be hidden. We are light. We shouldn't hide ourselves or our good deeds, in theory. This is pretty straightforward. We're nice Christians who don't murder or use the Lord's name in vain. We're quite partial to smiling and we put on a very good morning tea. But in practice, it's trickier, isn't it? We're not always the nice, smiling people. We don't always seem like the light of the world. We snap at our coworkers. We lose our temper when our kids have tantrums. We roll our eyes in contempt at the clueless substitute teacher. We're prone to the mediocre disturbances of everyday life. And sometimes we react out of folly. Or worse, we give in to sin. We drink too much. We judge other people whose lives don't live up to our standards. We curse the idiot in front of us who doesn't indicate. We watch porn. We make an idol out of money. Yet we are the light of the world. It's the tension of the now and the not yet. We're human and prone to folly and sin. Yet we are the light of the world. There's a danger here to go one of two extremes. Either we assume that just because we're the light of the world, we don't need to try and grow or develop as humans. Or we focus on the ways we feel we don't measure up and commit to striving, but at the expense of forgetting who we are. Jesus' example of light is helpful here. A light will always be a light. It can't be a book, or a plate, or a potato. It's a light. It has a number of purposes. To render what was invisible in the dark visible, and to guide people. Light becomes pretty useless when you put something over it. But it remains light. Its identity isn't compromised but its effectiveness is. The light doesn't stop being light, but it's not shining to its fullest. 
So for the sake of context, it's worth mentioning that Jerusalem was built on a hill. When Jesus says in verse 14 that a town built on a hill cannot be hidden, it's likely that his audience was thinking and reminded of Jerusalem. N.T. Wright puts it as such. Jerusalem, the city set on a hill, was supposed to be a beacon of hope to the world. His, Jesus's, followers were to be like that. Their deep, heartfelt keeping of God's laws would be a sign to the nations around that the one God, the Creator, the God of Israel, was God indeed, and that they should worship him. As Jesus' followers, one of our purposes is to shine our light to those around us so that they can identify God as the source of light and life and love. We are the city on the hill, the light of the world. We understand that that's our identity. That's who we are. So the question is perhaps, how do I steward myself well? How do I grow my light whilst remaining secure in my identity as light of the world? There's a meme that I found on the internet and it shows three of Pablo Picasso's self-portraits at age 18, 25 and 90. I think this evolution of Picasso's artistic sensibility can be related to our quest. Picasso was Picasso at age 18, and his self-portrait reflects a fairly normal, moody 18-year-old. At 25, we see him exploring with his range and style. He's not quite the artist he will be, but he's playing with form and he's experimenting. At age 90, his self-portrait is both Picasso and not Picasso. The portrait is of a human, but a human that looks unlike other humans. In a similar way, we are humans that are called to live unlike other people. We walk attention of being the people God made us to be, whilst also being on a journey to becoming the people God intended us to be. We'll never be perfect, and that's okay because we're redeemed by grace. But with Jesus, we can be the best versions of ourselves that we can be this side of heaven. So, how do we shine our light? I'm going to defer to N.T. Wright again, who says, Be reconciled, make friends. Pete McHugh echoed this idea at last year's Wellspring Conference when he spoke on Jesus' commandment in John 13, 34-35, when Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Being light in a dark world is a fundamentally radical call. It's a call to be the opposite. It's a call to love, to putting our neighbour first, to protecting the marginalised. It's the very call that Jesus embodied when he went to the cross. In today's world, being light can be a lot of different things. In our RBC family alone, we've seen the Changs shining their light by collecting food for those in need. We've seen Dione shining her light by helping a number of people in the church get connected via Zoom. We've seen Kathy Blakey and Phil Pogson post on social media about how they're doing church during these times. We've seen Laura and Trish caring for those who are vulnerable. And that's just naming a few. We shine our light in the big and little parts of our lives. Now, this is all good and easy when life's going okay, isn't it? 
It's kind of easier to get our heads around the idea that we're light when life is running smoothly. But what do we do when life isn't going according to plan? I was chatting to Andrew Wilkinson the other day and we talked about how difficult it is to see if someone's smiling when they're wearing a mask. You can't really tell what's going on for someone when they're wearing one of these, unless they have unusually expressive eyes. But I think sometimes we stumble into putting on emotional masks when everything isn't going okay to convince the world that it is. Because we're meant to be the light of the world and we're Christians and we want to seem nice. Or if we can't seem nice, we at least want to seem okay. Yet this seems to be one of the ways that we put the bowl over our light. Because we're not being authentic or true. What would it look like? For us to be light bearers with struggles. What would it be for us to say, look, don't get me wrong, I love following God, but I'm struggling with my family or my addiction or my job or being single. What would it be to remain authentic, to be real in both our Christian and non-Christian relationships, to be shining our light even when we don't feel okay or enough. To be secure enough in knowing that we are light even when it doesn't feel like it. Because in verse 15, Jesus says, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. It's worth reflecting on the bowls that we use to cover up our own light. What, cover, what covers do we put over ourselves? Do we hide our faith? Do we pull ourselves up when our inner dialogue doesn't reflect scripture? Are we too afraid of being vulnerable that we hide ourselves and thereby our light? Even in our worst, even when we don't feel enough, Jesus can use us to give light. The coverings we place over ourselves don't compromise who we are, but they can impact our effectiveness in shining. So, what's it all for? Why is it worth being vulnerable and going above and beyond and loving our neighbours? Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In Genesis 1.16, when God creates the sun and the moon, the writer refers to them as the greater and lesser light. Now, this was possibly because a lot of religions in the ancient Near East would worship the sun and the moon. Yet here God puts them in their place as a greater and lesser light. Nothing fancy, certainly not the light of the world. We are light because God is the ultimate light. To be more precise, he's the creator of light and life. Matthew 5, 14 to 16 is an affirmation of our identity. But it's also a reminder of what we are partnering in and why. We're light because a lot of people on this earth need to know the Father's love. When people look at us, what they are seeing is a people who have been redeemed by grace, who are light, who don't just know their creator, but who have relationship with him. To sum up, we walk attention of being the people that God made us to be, whilst also being on a journey to becoming the people God intended us to be. We shine our light in the big and little parts of our lives as we try and live out Jesus' commandment to love one another as he loves us. 
The coverings we place over ourselves don't impact our identity, but they can impact our effectiveness. And finally, that our call to be light, to shine uncovered, is not just for us. It's not just for our benefit. It's so that others may glorify God. There's a lot of darkness in this world, but that's not you. You are the light of the world. A light that shines as a beacon of hope in a dark world that speaks of the Lord God, the creator of light and life. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the immense privilege it is to partner with you. Thank you that you are light and life and love. Thank you for the immense privilege it is that we get to carry your light. Help us to glorify you and help us to be soft-hearted towards others, that they may come to know your love. In your precious son's name, amen.